Um, so my name is Janice Whitlock and I oversee the talk series for the center. And I'm gonna be quick because I really want to turn it over to Neil. Um, the, the vision, as many of you know, of the Bhakti Bhakti Center for Translational Research is to expand, strengthen, and speed the translation of science into practice and practice. So toward that end, I think this this topic, particularly in the way that Neil's gonna talk about it, is a perfect example of some of the ways that knowledge has huge impacts in the way that we do life. So I'm going to just do, uh, I'm going to read your bio, Neil, but I'm not going to tell them too much more about what you do and what you talk about, because I know you're going to talk about that. So Neil Lewis, Jr. is an assistant professor of communication and social behavior at Cornell University with a graduate field appointment in both communication and psych. He's also a faculty affiliate of Cornell Center for the Study of Inequality and the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research, as well as a fellow of the George Life Center for the Mind and Society of the University of Southern California. Prior to his current position, Neil was the interim director of the Preparation Initiative Program at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, and was a fellow at the International Max Planck Research School on the Life Course. <laughs> Neil is a first-generation college graduate. He earned his BA in uh, Econ and Psych at Cornell. I think he and I first crossed paths somewhere in there. Um, and his MS and PhD in Social Psychology at the University and has come home to Cornell and come. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me to come um, and all of you for coming at the end of the semester. I know this is a um, busy time of year. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to come um, and share some of the things I've been working on over the past couple of years and also get um, your feedback on some of the work. So as the title implies, I've been thinking a lot about um, what I think of as the psychological toll of social stratification um, and its effects on how people make meaning of their experiences in the world, um, as well as the implications of those meaning-making processes for people's motivation um, and behavior. Now, most of my work in this area um, has um, this, at least implicit, sometimes explicit goal, of really trying to understand how these processes uh, relate to uh, some broader social disparities um, in society. Um, disparities like that, um, that goes in educational attainment, right? So we know um, and have known for a long time that in the United States, um, students from white families are more likely to obtain college degrees than those from racial ethnic minority families. Throughout the talk, I'll um, use that term a bit. Um, what I'm usually referring to um, are when I say racial ethnic minorities, Black, uh, Latino, Native Americans, those are the groups that I um, focus on in a lot of this work. So there are these kinds of disparities um, in educational attainment. If, if you look at racial, along racial lines, um, you also see comparable kinds of things if you look along um, wealth and other um, socioeconomic lines, right? So um, students from wealthier families are more likely to obtain degrees than students from for families, um, a wealth advantage that's so powerful that um, one recent um, analysis from the Department of Education noted that a low performing um, high school student from a wealthy family has the same chance of graduating from college um, as a high performing student from a low income family. So student that um, does, didn't, do as well in high school, but their family's rich. <clears throat> Same chance of graduating as soon that did really well um, in high school, but families low income. If we look in the health domain, you see comparable um, the kinds of disparities. So study after study um, shows that uh, wealthier people tend to have uh, better health outcomes, longer life expectancies than uh, lower income people. You see similar kinds of racial disparities as well um, in health outcomes. Whites tend to have better health outcomes to live longer than racial minorities. Um, and you can even see some of these things if you look at um, geographic uh, distribution. So in the US, uh, people from the north um, and west tend to live longer um, on average than people from the south. You see these if you look at these broader um, level data sets, as I've been talking about, but you can also see it in smaller um, microcosms. So um, if you look, for, um, for example, at county level data at different parts of the US. So before I came back to Cornell, I was living in Washington County, Michigan. 
um, in Ann Arbor. And a couple years ago, um, the city of Ypsilanti, which is one of the cities in that county, um, released uh, this report that talked about life expectancy within the county. And what we see there is there's a 19 year gap in life expectancy uh, between people who live in Chelsea Village, which is one of the wealthier and whiter areas in the county, um, than people who live in Ypsilanti Township, which is one of the poorer and browner areas of the county. Now, patterns like this are not new. Um, they've been persisting for quite a while. And um, when you look at some projections, they're projected to continue um, pretty far into the future. Um, some projections um, talking about 75 to 100 years, depending on which outcomes we're looking at. Um, so looking at data like this um, has been somewhat troubling to me. Um, and you know, one of my Red advisors always said you should study the things that keep you up at night, the things that bother you. Um, and so this data has really um, inspired much of the work that I do and it's led me to ask sort of two broad questions in my work. One, why do these disparities occur? Um, and two, if we don't want to wait another century, um, what might we do to try and close some of them? And so that's what I'll talk about a bit about today. Um, look, focusing on both education and health uh, data. So to begin answering some of these questions, we started um, a few years ago by conducting broad survey of disparities literature from across the social sciences. So um, read a lot of papers on education disparities, you know, from sociologists, economists, psychologists, public policy people. Um, we wrote one paper about that. Did the same thing looking at health disparities, trying to figure out what is um, sort of the consensus out there about why these things are happening. Um, and then once we got some baseline um, understanding from there, we did some more of our own studies to try to tease apart mechanisms and also develop some interventions. But doing um, this review or initial review work revealed um, something that I think is really important. Um, it became very clear to us that we can't answer these questions um, without really um, first reckoning with the past. Um, what I mean by that, it didn't matter what sort of where we started, which angles um, we looked at, all roads sort of led back to um, these historical discriminatory policies within the US um, that produced um, vastly different access to social and economic capital. Right, so we know this, um, Jim Crow was a thing, um, we um, have a lay understanding of this, but one thing is we often think, well, yes, those things happen. They're just issues of the past. Surely we're past that. You know, we elected Barack Obama twice. Um, all must be well. Uh, the reality is we still see a lot of effects of those policies still today. Um, so if we take the most recent census, for instance, and we map, uh, so this is from 2010, and we map where people live, um, we see patterns like this all across the U.S. So you're realizing that it's a bit hard to see, so I'll point out um, what's happening here. So this is a map of where people live in southeastern Michigan, again, where um, a lot of my thinking about this started. And what you see there is in this um, southeastern quadrant of uh, the Detroit area, uh, that's where um, all of the black folks in uh, that part of the city are living. Um, and there's this pretty sharp line, that's eight mile road, where once you cross it, um, that's where um, you see, so the suburbs starting where um, white folks are living. You see a similar line, I forget which road this is, uh, but um, that's another dividing line, where left of that, um, you don't really see many racial minorities living anymore. So um, the point is, we still have really high levels of racial and economic segregation um, in the US today. Um, why does that matter? Uh, well, it puts us in the following situation when you think about, so I'll focus first on, on education. If you look at the public schools, um, what you see is um, you know, Black and Latino students, for instance, tend to attend highly segregated schools in which uh, the vast majority of students are also racial and minority and low income. Um, so 90% or more um, of the makeup of these schools 
fall into this category. Um, this is not data from the 1950s. This is data from the past five years. Um, and these students tend to live in contexts that um, are not only highly segregated, but the schools um, in those contexts tend to also be low performing. So to draw on some recent data from uh, Michigan again, the state of Michigan is actually currently um, being sued in a class action lawsuit by students from the Detroit Public School District. And they're being sued um, because the schools, um, uh, yeah, at least um, some of the school, many of the schools in that district now have gotten to a point where um, proficiency rates for students hover around zero in all subjects. So at best, um, some of these schools are scoring in the sixth percentile um, in this state's standards. Um, now, part of this is money, um, right? So we know that the that wealth, uh, because schools uh, are funded a large part on local taxes, that wealth sort of uh, trickles into the resources of the school. But part of this is also direct policy problems. <coughs> uh, so another reason this lawsuit has legs is because of this legislation that was passed in 2016, um, where the state decided that, well, Teachers um, in this school district, and this school district only, um, are not required to be certified. 2016, uh, this was passed. Um, the only, in this one district where the majority of students are um, and low income students. So um, this tends to matter, right? That's one factor that there are these structural issues that tend to um, undermine um, academic achievement, but being in these environments also matters for another set of reasons, right? So in these environments, there are often low density of college graduates um, in these um, kinds of neighborhoods. And that matters um, for not only the structural reasons that we talked about, um, but also psychological um, reasons. So living in places more college graduates uh, means attending better schools in part because of what college graduates contribute to the tax base, um, but these are also the people that are the, uh, in some sense, uh, annoying, nagging people in school board meetings pushing for more and more from the district. Um, but being in those environments also means having access um, to models of people who have succeeded um, in those domains. Um, people that can share um, these sort of cultural knowledge with students um, or how you actually um, get on the path and stay on the path um, to college. So, you know, going to college seems much more realistic and easy uh, when you're growing up in a place like Ithaca where every other person you meet, you know, uh, has or is working on a PhD. Uh, we can sort of talk to you casually about going to college than if you're growing up in a place where um, you don't meet any of those people. Um, so, patterns of stratification can have the direct effects on academic and health outcomes because of the resource accounts that's often written about by economists, sociologists, and the like, but um, it also has intervening effects on psychological processes. It can um, affect how often you're thinking about yourself, say, as a college um, bound person, and whether college is <laughs> feeling like a place where you belong. Um, we'll talk about some studies on that in a moment. It can affect whether you learn the strategies that are necessary to get there and how uh, you can use them. And it can also um, affect how you interpret your experiences along the way. Um, and one set of experiences that um, I focus a lot on is the experience of difficulty. Um, so when the going gets tough, as inevitably well, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean uh, that you should, it's not worth your time, you should give up? Or does that mean this is important, um, sort of no pain, no gain, it's time to persist? Um, we have some evidence that the patterns of stratification sort of influence how you end up thinking um, in this way. So the first study um, I'll share with you is um, one that's been looking at um, effects of um, stratification on students' sense of belonging um, in college. So um, one way that we've been looking at, we've been studying this process um, is by studying students that come from um, sort of different uh, backgrounds. So this study um, is one of 
um, looking at first generation versus continuing grad, uh, generation students at the University of Michigan. So um, while I was there, there was um, a big effort by the university to recruit more um, first generation students um, to campus. And they did so in part by targeting recruitment efforts in the um, areas that I was just showing you on that map. Um, my understanding is Cornell is also trying to do similar things. So these results might be relevant to um, movements here as well. So one of the things we're wondering about was, um, what are the experiences like um, for students when they come to a place like Michigan or a place like Cornell? Um, given that um, they've often had very different experiences um, growing up than, say, students whose families' names are on buildings, um, what might it be like to um, be on those campuses? So we had a study where we recruited undergrads, um, both first-gen and continuing-gen students, um, to participate in a laboratory study where that was ostensibly about how students sell their personal narratives. So they came into the lab, and we had them write essays that were um, essentially admissions um, essay um, prompts. And we're still in the process of coding them now. Um, but in addition to writing the essays, we were interested in measuring their sense of belonging um, on campus. Um, so we had them answer questions like, to what extent do you agree um, that you feel like you really belong um, at the University of Michigan? And we focused on this belonging because we have some other work um, and others around the country um, keep finding um, these patterns where students that feel like they belong are more likely to persist and actually graduate. Um, if you don't feel like you belong, um, then you're more likely to drop out. So um, this sense of belonging really matters for some important outcomes that um, we care about. Um, what we're finding so far, and you know, this work is ongoing, um, but what we're finding so far is there is a significant difference in sense of belonging by first generation status. So our first generation students um, feel like they belong on campus less than their continuing generation peers. Uh, and we're not the only ones that are finding it. There's a group at Stanford that's um, finding the same kinds of things. Another group in Texas is finding the same kinds of things. So this seems to be um, a consistent finding uh, around the country. Um, and part of this is because of having um, such different experiences. You know, I talked about the, the schools before because that matters for when they um, get to college. So one of the things I did um, in Michigan, Janice mentioned in her introduction, is um, I worked with and then for a year directed this program um, on campus called the Preparation Initiative. That was a program that was, was an academic intervention program um, that was really uh, focused on uh, helping students from the first generation, other first generation, low income, uh, other uh, minority groups um, who wanted to excel um, in business. And one of the things that would often happen with our students is inevitably every year, um, the semester would start, they'd go to class. Um, the classes that usually produce this effect were like um, math classes, like calculus. But students would go to class, and then after that, would come crying in my office. Like, well, what's wrong? Uh, and the response was always something like, Neil, I don't know if this is the place. Uh, this is the place for me. Everything we learned uh, today on day one of class, we covered the past year uh, in high school, right? Um, so the resources of the high school and the experiences they had there, um, in some ways, uh, made the experience at Michigan somewhat more shocking and made them really question whether or not they belonged there. Um, so then um, we have to, of course, do some pep talk, yes you can, um, and sort of provide some resources um, along the way. But that's one way that these processes end up playing out, um, is that you know, the experiences you've had before um, carry over with you uh, to affect the experiences now. So another way we've looked at this is to ask, outside of the university context, um, do some of these motivational constructs uh, matter or vary by social position? So another um, thing we did a couple years ago was just conduct a broad survey where we measured another uh, motivational construct 
that we know matters for some of these persistence outcomes. Uh, and that is the interpretation of uh, experience difficulty, which I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So this study, we recruited um, a little over a thousand adults from um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, and we asked them about um, the interpretation of experience difficulty. Oh. What's the Mechanical Turk? Great question, yes. <laughs> mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk is this um, online panel, essentially, where you can recruit people who are willing to complete short surveys for a relatively cheap amount of money. Um, and so um, this is one way that um, social science, particularly, um, I think social psych, social psychology has been using this a lot, um, can recruit relatively large samples for low cost. So yeah, um, we recruit these participants um, and ask them to fill out this scale um, of interpretation of experience difficulty. Um, and this is another one of those scales that time and time again um, predicts persistence um, in and performance in a number of domains. So um, the consistent finding about this scale is um, people that agree more that with items like if a task feels, feels difficult, that means it's important, uh, tend to persist more in the face of adversity. Um, so this tends to predict um, how much effort students put um, into school, so how much time they spend on homework, the grades in schools, uh, in the health domain, it predicts sticking with health goals, um, things like that. It, um, so this mindset predicts lots of uh, persistence outcomes. So they answer these questions, oops, yeah, they answer these questions and then uh, fill out some demographic information. And we're looking at just um, how do um, these demographic markers, which we can think about as some proxies for social stratification, how do they correlate um, with this mindset. Um, what we found is there are sort of two dimensions of stratification that mattered quite a bit. Uh, one was level of education, and the other was race of um, And that's what I have plotted up here. What we found was overall there's a main effect of education where so people um, who have obtained higher levels of education tend to agree more that difficulty in support. Uh, but this is really moderated by uh, race ethnicity. So um, this effect was much stronger for racial ethnic minorities. Um, in this case, again, um, African American, uh, Latino, Native American, um, whereby those who obtain high levels of education um, agreed most strongly that yes, difficulty means importance. Uh, those who had not, um, who had relatively low levels of education, so less than high school in this case, uh, disagreed strongly that. Um, difficulty needs importance. And this kind of, kind of makes sense given the differences in life experiences. So um, those of us who have obtained um, um, high levels of education, when we work harder, we usually see the results of our labor, uh, right? Um, whereas that's not always true on this other end of the spectrum, where um, people may often have to work two or three jobs with little uh, mobility. And return for that, and so it makes sense that you would disagree with this idea that uh, you know the difficulty experiencing um, is important. Um, but this can matter um, for downstream outcomes. So when we think about sort of observational from an observational learning perspective, uh, kids growing up in these different environments where they're seeing people that are working really hard and either. Um, being rewarded for that or not. That can affect how they think about whether or not their own efforts may matter. Um, and um, also on an explicit level, we have some uh, other preliminary data showing that um, parents, well, adults <coughs> generally, um, interpretation difficulty affects the kind of advice they give to kids. Um, so that can matter um, as well. But um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that you know this is just a purely deterministic model once you've learned um, and once that you're stuck there forever. Um, once we understand some of these processes, um, then we can start thinking about how we might intervene um, to try and address some of these disparities. So I'm gonna talk a bit about that um, as well. Um, so, you know, in the spirit of the Bronfenbrenner Center, <laughs> one thing we've been thinking about a lot is 
um, interventions that we can develop to, um, to try and change some of these patterns. Um, we can think about that as um, interventions at school level, at broader policy levels, and the like, and I'll tell you a bit about um, some of that work that we've been doing lately. So one project that's ongoing, it's really a 13-year longitudinal study if you want to think about it that way. Um, it's a project with the Lansing School District in Michigan that is an academic intervention that's built around college savings accounts. So a few years ago, um, Lansing became very interested in starting a universal um, college savings account program because um, they learned about this research that was showing that using panel study of income dynamics data um, was showing that uh, low-income kids, um, which is the majority of that district, um, low-income kids who had college savings accounts with as little as $500 in them were six times more likely to go to college and three times more likely to graduate. And so they were like, oh, wow, college savings accounts um, are a simple intervention that we can do uh, to vastly improve. Um, and I thought, well, that study is really um, interesting, but it can't be a money thing, right? $500 barely covers textbooks for a semester. Um, so it can't be about the money um, that um, these accounts are having these effects. Um, so one way that we were thinking about it is, well, maybe what the account is doing is, in some sense, creating a very vivid path in students' minds uh, for college. Um, so if you have a bank account, you have a bank account that's marked for college, that suggests that college is this real future for you, and thus you better get your act together so that you can get there. Um, having this um, path, this connection to the future, um, we have some other work showing that that really um, is motivating uh, for people. So, um, we are continuing to work with them uh, to test uh, sort of these mechanisms along the way uh, to see what will end up happening. Um, so these students are getting these accounts in kindergarten, and we will see um, by the time they get to college what happens. Um, this is one of several programs like this around the country. San Francisco has one, uh, Cuyahoga County in Ohio has one. They're starting to pop up in more and more places. So we'll see um, over time what happens. Um, part of the reason this seems promising to me um, is there's some other evidence showing that um, these kind of vivid uh, pathways do really change the way that students think uh, about what is possible for them uh, and thus increases motivation to work in school. So uh, Mesmond Destin is a social psychologist in Northwestern who's been doing uh, work on financial aid um, and its effects on low-income students. And what um, he's been finding over and over again is that just providing students with information, low-income students, um, about need-based financial aid policies really increases the amount of effort um, they put into school. Um, and so for high-income students, it, this doesn't matter. Um, so that's... Um, um, over here um, on the right are students who have high assets. Telling them about financial aid does nothing for them. Um, for low-income students, um, providing this information about need-based financial aid uh, really um, increases the amount of time they spent um, doing homework um, and you know, all the other good school things that produces better outcomes. And the reason is that, again, it's creating this um, pathway. So if you are thinking, well, even if I did work really hard in school, but my family can't afford it, like it doesn't, in some sense, your effort seems futile. Uh, but if now there's um, suddenly a pathway, um, it changes what your effort means. Um, and so it's now worthwhile to put in uh, the effort um, in school. So that's um, both our work as well as his work and others um, suggests to us that these are some ways that we can, um, we can intervene to sort of change the way that students are thinking um, and improve some academic outcomes. 
But another important lesson from these findings, I think, is that it suggests that um, aspirations really aren't the problem. So when I first started doing this work um, and would ask people about why do they think that you know, low-income um, racial minority students aren't um, you know, going to college as much, um, one thing that people would often say is, well, they don't value education the same way. They don't really have the aspirations um, to go to college. And so that's something we actually looked for um, in this review paper that I mentioned um, early on. We looked for um, studies of academic aspirations. Um, did they actually differ um, by race, ethnicity, and or levels of income? And most of the findings are, no, they're the same. <laughs> levels of aspirations are the same. When they were different, it was um, low income and racial minority students having higher aspirations. Um, so that was another, um, I think, important lesson from this work is aspirations are not the problem. What it seems to be different is how clear, how clear the path is um, towards success, right? So for some, again, if you're growing up in environments where everyone you know went to college, that's, I can sort of give you pointers along the way pathway is much more clear. Um, if you're not in those environments, uh, you might still have those goals, but if it's less clear how you might get there, um, it's much harder to um, achieve those goals. And so um, that's something that's important to understand as we try to build uh, pathways um, to help um, students along the way. So I'll return briefly to the preparation initiative. Um, this was something that um, was developed um, by understanding some of these processes. Um, so Frank Yates at the University of Michigan started this program about a little over 10 years ago that was again geared towards trying to improve the success of low-income minority students that were, um, that were interested in business. The business angle is mostly because the business school had money to fund such a program, and so that was uh, really uh, helpful. Um, for being able to work on some of these issues. But um, the program really takes some of these um, background factors into mind and provides both structural and sort of um, psychological um, help along the way. So for our students, we looked very closely at what their high school experiences were like. So um, in admitting students to the program, we spent a lot of time focusing on the high school transcript. Uh, not only just, you know, overall GPAs, um, which is what I think the university mostly looks at, but we look carefully at what were their, um, what classes did they have um, in high school, what opportunities did they have to take some of these classes, these advanced uh, placement classes in some cases. Did those high schools offer them? Um, did the students take them? How did they do in those classes? Um, and what do we know about those schools and how um, they teach those things. From that, we could then develop an academic coaching program um, to actually help students um, make it through the, and thrive really, um, in the courses that they were taking when they got to Michigan. Um, another thing is we knew that this um, sense of belonging thing was a problem. So we had peer mentoring as part of the program. Um, we had academic advising um, as part of the program. And really, it was this um, learning community that was developed here that addresses all of these um, barriers. Um, so the program had been going on for a while. Um, I started working with them um, when I first got to Michigan and worked with them throughout. Um, and one of the years when Frank was on sabbatical, I actually ran the program. And in that year, um, what we did was um, a program evaluation. We're like, well, this has been going on for 10 years now. Um, we think it's helpful, but is it actually helpful? It would be good to know. Um, so we ran a program evaluation, and what we found was um, the program had, you know, much larger effects than we even imagined it would. So students were performing, um, we were getting much higher grades um, in particularly their quantitative courses that they were taking at Michigan, economics and math. Those were sort of core focuses for the business school. Um, but in addition, they had 13% um, higher graduation rates than equally matched peers um, at the university. Uh, and so that was pretty um, striking to us that 
Um, I mean, you know, we thought it was doing something, but we didn't think it was doing that much. <laughs> um, so that was really helpful to learn that um, really structuring, building a program that's addressing all these barriers can have some meaningful uh, gains for students. I'm gonna check this out. Okay. So um, in the interim, you know, stratification can influence disparities in academic outcomes and how we understand them, in part because of um, social structure, but it, um, as well as the psychological um, effects of that. But you can develop interventions that target these things um, to try and mitigate some of these disparities. Um, what about health? I alluded to um, health having similar issues in the beginning of the talk. Um, well, it's a pretty similar story there. Um, so there are certainly issues of access um, where those on you know, sort of lower dimensions of social um, hierarchy tend to have less access to quality healthcare, um, you know, lower rates of ha having health insurance and the like. This is, of course, why uh, the debate about healthcare in this country is so important. If you don't have um, health insurance, then you don't go to the doctor as much. Uh, and really, even if you do go to the doctor, you don't get the same treatment um, as people who do. So access certainly matters. Um, but it's not the case that access is the full story. Um, disparities persist even in countries that have um, national health insurance. Um, and in the US, even after controlling for insurance, you still see um, some of these disparities. They're smaller, but um, they still exist. So what else might be going on? One thing we've been um, thinking about is that when society is um, stratified along some of these social dimensions, people can start seeing behaviors um, in line uh, or along those dimensions um, as either being sort of in-group defining, in-group consistent, in-group congruent, or not. Um, so people see many health behaviors as related to their um, important social identities. Um, and so some of the work in this area has shown, for instance, that uh, racial minority and lower SES folks um, sometimes see um, unhealthy behaviors is in group behind in group defining and some healthy behaviors as um, out group uh, white or wealthy things to do and I'll show you some data on that right now um, a little over a decade ago Daphne Oysterman, Stephanie Freiberg and Nick Yoder did the study with um, students well they did like six studies in this paper uh, with students um, both college students I think they have middle school students as well um, from all over but they had this consistent finding where um, on a number of different health behaviors, um, minority students were doing them less. So um, how often in the, the past 30 days um, were you making efforts to eat healthy, get enough sleep, um, exercise, and the like. They were finding this consistent, these consistent um, racial gaps where minority students were doing these things less. Then the question was, well, why um, is this? Um, how are students thinking about these behaviors? And interestingly, um, students were seeing some of these behaviors along racial lines, uh, racial and economic lines. Um, that, and what I mean by that is um, minority students um, would often describe some of these things as, you know, basically rich white people things. So eating kale and quinoa, uh, <laughs> the more uh, you think about that as not something that people would be do, the less likely you are to engage in those behaviors. And so the more that um, students were seeing this as outgroup defining, the less willing they were actually to um, engage in those behaviors. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes depressing, but um, also kind of <laughs> weird that um, really some of these access issues um, end up, again, shaping the way you think about these things. So if you can't afford uh, you know, to go to the Whole Foods and get some of these things, um, in some ways you, in some way you start, well, psychologically distancing yourself from uh, some of these behaviors. Well, that's not right. Um, and so that's, I think, another um, depressing way that some of these processes end up playing out. Um, but it's not just a, um, a black-white thing. We also see 
some of these things within uh, racial groups as well. And um, so the last set of studies I'll talk about is an example from the smoking behavior literature, actually. So if we look at some recent trends um, in smoking, um, one thing we know is that smoking um, is screwed sort of down among high uh, SES whites, uh, whereas it's um, still <coughs> quite common among uh, lower SES um, and rural whites. Um, and part of the reason it's down among um, high SES whites is it's become highly stigmatized, right? It's um, in the same way that I was talking about the other behaviors before, smoking is now one of these things that's yeah, really stigmatized among this group. It's not what we do. Um, and so um, that ends up um, driving down uh, smoking behavior in that population as well. So again, lines of stratification can end up influencing um, how people think about these behaviors and whether or not it's um, congruent with their identities. Um, so I want to leave some time for discussion, so I'll quickly uh, wrap up. Um, across this work, again, we're seeing that stratification influences how people make meaning of the world around them. Um, that meaning can shape um, what they're motivated to do, how often they engage in different kinds of behavior. Um, and I think this has some potentially important implications for how we understand um, and address some of these population level disparities um, and outcomes like education um, and health. Uh, so I want to quickly thank um, my collaborators um, on Cross these various projects, Christina Laney in Paris, Sonia Nelson at the University of Michigan, Beth Oisterman at the University of Southern California, and Denise Sikoklaktua and Frank Yates at the University of Michigan, and really all of my research assistants, both past and present, uh, who've um, done a lot of work um, helping with data collection, coding, and the like. Um, none of this would have been possible without them. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, taking the time to come. Thanks again for inviting me, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions. Yeah, I, I don't have data on that, um, but that has come up um, in um, other parts of literature that, yeah, there's, in some sense, like, you always have to be on the grind, like, right. the, in order to achieve, um, and so sometimes you, you'll make some sacrifices along the way. Yeah, I don't have data on that, but that's something that I see. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was interested in the, the interventions you were talking about, like the idea of like, setting the destination. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was curious though about, like, um, could say more about sort of like who's setting those um, expectations and like who's um, like like who actually like who did, where did they think the policy has to come from and and like what sense does that make sense? Yeah, good question. Um, so, well, I'll separate the answers um, broadly in terms of um, the goals. We don't give uh, in our intervention studies. We don't give since we ask them what they want to achieve and. Whatever they say, um, we take as given. Um, almost 100% of them do have this goal of um, going to college because they realize how much it matters for so many outcomes. So that's uh, one piece. Um, the second piece, um, in terms of the accounts, they know that it's um, the accounts are sort of coming from the city. Um, so it's in some sense, it's your city investing um, in uh, your future. Um, so they're Lansing Save. Um, accounts um, that um, you know are held at the local credit union um, in Lansing, um, and so, but it's like the city that's putting in the seed money for, for the account. Your parents can add to it too, and you know relatives can add to it too. But um, the foundation is the city. Here, uh, Professor Lewis, I had a question about um, given kind of thought on how to separate uh, stratification from absolute poverty. As you know, there's a lot of back and forth with the spirit level and stuff like this. Is it relative deprivation or is it the fact that countries that have higher, more of a hierarchy also have lower, uh, the absolute poverty is much greater and the more people. 
human thoughts about is that like an impossible thing to dis disentangle or do you think there's ways to get at that? Yeah, um, so when I first started, um, particularly with that education um, disparities paper, that's exactly what I was trying to do is figure out how much we can pull it apart. Um, it is really hard to pull that apart. Um, and so, yeah, it's something I'm constantly thinking about. I don't know what the answer is yet. Um, and how, but there's so much overlap among all these things. It's, yeah, it's really hard to pull these things apart. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask about, um, when you went to populations, mm. whether that was factored in at all, along with families in this country, yeah, um, I haven't done much work um, on immigration. Um, <laughs> I know that there are a lot of people in the sociology department who are doing some work on that. Um, I think surely it must matter, um, well, depending on, also depending on where you're immigrating from and um, what you bring. So, um, you know, how much wealth is coming with you versus not. I think that would certainly matter, but I, I don't know the immigration work well enough to um, be able to speak to how much it matters. Thanks so much for your talk. I had a, um, actually more research design related question yeah. because I don't know, I don't really know that much about the measures used to capture some of these mm -hmm. components. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how your team came up with the question that you ran in MCRIC about your interpretation yeah. of difficulty. Like, could you talk a little bit more? Yeah, so the interpretation of difficulty questionnaire um, is one that was first developed by Dr. Oysterman, my advisor. Um, this, so she did a lot of uh, scale validation. Kristen is also a part of this. A lot of scale validation work in the uh, mid to late 2000s. Um, so this scale has been, yeah, uh, it's a well established scale now that um, we use. Them. Yeah. So there, again, yeah, I'd be happy to send you. Um, papers on the, that if you'd like to see more. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I did my master's thesis actually at Michigan but on the algebra project that Bob Moses was a civil rights activist and he yeah. argued that there are particularly high school, all junior high and high schools that are left over like a sharecropper mentality where it's presumed that the kids that go to that high school, for example, are not going to go to college mm -hmm. and therefore they're not offering the math courses they would need to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, ACT, SAT, let alone succeed in college. So I'm, uh, you know, your intervention talks about the PAC, but I'm also curious, you know, interventions that are more targeted towards, I guess, Detroit. Maybe that's the case in Detroit where they're arguing they're not offering. I mean, I don't know what the yeah. argument is there exactly, but yeah. do you see that movement where also they're looking at what's offered at schools? You know, they've been, they're, the assumption is not that someone is not going to, there's options, the option to go to college. Yeah, I mean, Detroit is, um, it's interesting because, um, yeah, the, the pathway from school has sort of changed so much as the economy has changed, right? So there was a time that it was um, very feasible to graduate from high school um, and either go into agriculture or, you know, went back to Ford with the bakery, um, and that was a path to um, a lifestyle. The, um, shift now has been towards prepping more students for college because that's just the way the world has gone. But um, resources um, come up a lot in the discussions there, um, in part because there's been this sort of mass exodus from Detroit, so there's just not much money um, going into the schools or even covering firefighters and things like that. But, so a lot of the conversation there has been really about we would like our students be prepared uh, to go. How do we do that? Um, really given um, some financial constraints. This is fascinating. Um, I was kind of thinking about um, belonging as kind of being a positive way to think about inclusion, but I, to what extent do you think cynicism uh, in terms of perceiving these institutions as sort of hostile and alien plays a role and to what extent is that something that the research is engaged with? Um, it's a great question. Um, I, I'm not familiar with much work on the cynicism part. Um, there's been a lot of focus on belonging, um, 
and why people um, do or don't feel like they belong. The closest um, to cynicism I've come to <laughs> uh, in the work is looking at um, so I have studies on belonging um, instead of you know racial and economic lines along gendered lines in STEM contexts. So um, women in engineering is another group that I study along in. Their belonging um, tends to vary a lot more by experiences of discrimination. And so that's another path to undermining a uh, sense of belonging. But I don't know how much, um, say, racial minority students, low income students are thinking about you know, these institutions broadly as being uh, yeah, uh, hostile. Um, I suspect as we see more and more of these um, stories uh, popping up in universities, including some happening right here on this campus, that those concerns are lingering. Um, but I don't know uh, many studies of people actually measuring that. So, um, I really enjoyed the, your talk a lot. And it reminded me of um, uh, some of the work of, I mean, a popular book that he's written, uh, Anthony Bright has uh, written uh, Learning to Improve. And he talks about their um, uh, uh, math intervention in community colleges. Uh -huh. And one of, one of the things I remember from that book was the, at the beginning of class, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the semester, yeah. in a remedial math kind of class, um, the sense of, sense of belonging seemed to be sensitive to initial conditions mm -hmm. at the beginning of the semester. Okay. Um, and uh, so that uh, almost as if, you know, students might be predisposed to assuming, mm -hmm. you know, that based on their life history that, that you know, the system is stacked against them. Mm -hmm. As early uh, interactions, if they confirm that bias, mm -hmm. um, it's now very difficult to overcome. Yes. Um, their intervention they found was that if they could intervene early mm -hmm. and it was and they were using a growth mindset kind of thing okay. um, they were able to to improve successful completion rates of, mm -hmm. in this remedial math and I was curious if you've heard of other research related to sort of timing of first interaction I also thought of this with um, interactions with medical doctors mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and also the program you uh, directed for that yeah. year yeah. Was there an aspect of sort of how you set those initial conditions with the students? Yeah, this is um, great. So it, it, it sometimes it ties to um, the yeah, expectations, yeah, the expectations literature, and we know that what you expect mm -hmm. going in can matter a great deal. Um, the timing of interventions um, is something people are thinking about a lot now. Um, we had a pre-conference on scaling interventions a couple months ago. Um, where this was a big theme is when you do it matters. Um, in our program, we did do some work um, at the beginning of the program. So we had a pre-semester orientation um, to try and um, set some of these um, expectations. So one problem that we um, learned a few years ago was uh, many of our students actually had um, unrealistic <laughs> expectations of how the course was going to go coming in. I mean, because all these things, I mean, if you admit it, you were like a star in your school, right? Um, and so you come in thinking like, well, school is always relatively easy for me, like, because you were at the top of the distribution there. Um, and so we have to do um, some norm setting really that, yes, like you were great uh, in high school, but being great here means something different now. Like we, um, it's going to take a lot more work. Um, than you probably ever had to do. Um, and um, so we, um, particularly in that last year, um, spent, you know, like a, we had a two day sort of orientation to what does it take to be successful at the University of Michigan. Um, that we talked about things like where you're sitting in the class, um, you know, making sure you're sitting up front um, where you can avoid the distractions, but also that you get to know the professor because that matters a lot. Um, talking about you know what office hours are and how to make the most of those, um, the ways you take notes and um, sort of go back and revise those notes later, um, and jotting down your questions. So all of these sort of uh, kinds of skills that we take for granted um, and the sort of assume students know, um, we made sure that they are actually 
know that those things are on. And that seemed to be quite helpful um, in that last year. Um, that, yeah, they had a better sense of what they're getting into. Um, I have a question to that. Um, but on the health side, so a lot of my work is really interested in narrative and the role that narrative plays in the health center. And uh, the identity based narratives that you refer to are, are fascinating. And I wonder if there's, I mean, it seems in the educational context, they may be fairly modifiable in the ways that you talked about. Yep. How have there been studies on, on how to modify like, health linked and lifestyle linked narratives that are identity based? And how, how you know, what are the, the levers? That yeah. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I had, cut some of that for time, but no uh, way. So in that same paper, uh, one thing that was really effective was shifting the narrative from race-based to nationality-based. So when um, so changing um, from thinking about health behaviors as you know black or white things to uh, these are American things, then you uh, change behavior. Um, you increase these health behaviors for everyone. Uh, and there's some other studies like this um, <laughs> that can move the things around in interesting ways. So if you, there's studies um, in England where they were having students think about health behaviors as either um, health, their British health behaviors in comparison to Americans versus the Japanese. <laughs> uh, and so if you're comparing to Americans, that's a good thing. That's motivating. Um, so you can just be better. <laughs> it's easy to be better than those unhealthy Americans. If you're comparing to the Japanese, it's kind of demotivating. Uh, <laughs> they're stereotypes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these um, comparisons uh, really matter for how you can move around. Yeah. But it seems like we, we like an in-person analysis. We want to have something affiliated. Yeah, the um, the in group versus out group thing uh, does seem to uh, matter, uh, and how you define those groups. Yeah. Uh, kind of uh, one more question. Yeah, um, question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any research on, I guess, those minority students who go back home during breaks, mm -hmm. um, and that affects those affects that. Um, I guess their overall belonging. Because I feel like I've met many peers who mm -hmm. go back home during break mm -hmm. and they're reminded that they're not this fancy person that they're trying to become in school. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of just, I feel like it, it does dam more damage mm -hmm. um, when going back home. So was, is there any research in that? Um, so we had, in, for our students um, in the PI, that's the going back home issue um, actually mattered a lot for our students, but it wasn't um, necessarily the break thing as much as um, so many of our students, um, their families were still relying on them uh, to help in some way. So uh, because, you know, school is like 45 minutes, home's 45 minutes away, mm -hmm. families were often asking students, you know, come home and help, um, you know, mom's got to go to work, can you come home today and take care of your brother? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. So that was, um, it, that was quite damaging. Um, for our, our students' performance. Um, and so one of the things we actually started doing um, in the end was parent orientation um, mm -hmm. to um, provide parents with information about how um, you know, these requests that come home all the time, it's actually undermining your students' ability uh, to succeed. Um, and so, and that was a really, in some ways, controversial thing because on one hand, the family does need the students to help, on the other hand, um, it can be harming the students. So I think that can matter. Um, in terms of the break thing, and um, in some sense, what you're thinking about is like sw really switching right. between your school identity and your um, home previous life identity. I, I think that, that can be motivating or demotivating, depends on how you, depending on how you think about it. It can be motivating in the sense of um, leading you to sort of double down and say, well, I, I really need to um, focus so that I can help my family. Um, or um, you can get the other uh, hand yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. I think we need to wrap it up. Thank you.